Peter. First Peter, I was uh, praying and kind of struggling with what I was going to preach on tonight, and we finally landed over there in First Peter, so that's where we're going to go, and we're going to just kind of look at the verses and preach on them. Isn't that what preaching is supposed to be about, right? About the Bible? Not about philosophies and all that sort of thing, but what the Word of God is, what thus saith the Lord is. Anyways, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice now for a season, if need be, uh, ye are in the heaven, heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than gold that perish, though, through, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom in having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Maybe we should have sung that song. But anyways, let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with us tonight as we come to look into your scriptures. I pray, Lord, as your messenger, that you would lead me in everything that I should say and hold back anything I should not. Lord, I pray that you'd endue me with power from on high, Lord, to, to, for this task, Lord, of preaching your word. And Lord, if there's any sin unconfessed in my life, I pray you'd forgive it of me. Lord, that I be a fit vessel for you to use tonight. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. We may not be many in number here tonight, Lord, but we come hungry for something from God's word. And I pray that you'd provide it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I get started here talking about the book of 1 Peter and the verses we just read, let's talk about the writer of this book. Now, I know the Holy Spirit is ultimately the writer of any scriptures. The Bible says, holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I can't help but think of David and what he said. He said, the word of the Lord was in my tongue. Uh, the word of the Lord was in Peter's tongue, but God used Peter uh, to write these words. Now, these words were pinned down by a fisherman. And y'all know I like fishermen. I happen to try to be a fisherman myself. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, I used to be a fisherman, now I'm just somebody that likes to fish. But anyways, this was pinned down by fishermen. Now, I'm talking about the profession of fishing. I'm not talking about going out on your leisure time and enjoying being out on the lake and catching fish, whether you want to eat them or just have a, a time out there in nature. I'm talking about people who had the profession back 2,000 years ago of being a fisherman. Usually these folks were poor folks. Usually these folks did not have a great education. And you know that by Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Listen to what it says there. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Look there, they were unlearned and ignorant men in their estimation. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. They didn't go to the schools of the prophets. They weren't, they weren't men of renown. They're just fishermen. They were unlearned. But I like it that they marveled at the fact that all these things were being done uh, through their preaching. That folks were being saved and, and crowds were gathering and that people were being healed. They marveled and they know why that these unlearned and ignorant men were able uh, to uh, have such sway. It's because they'd been with Jesus. And may, being with Jesus always makes the difference. I can tell when I've been with Jesus. I can tell when I get away from Him too. You ought to be able to tell that too. 
Many liberal scholars, by the way, say that such men could not have written uh, such, a, such a text like we have here in Peter. This is a, if you read the book of Peter, I tell you, well, it's pretty amazing to read it. Scholars say, no, Peter, a fisherman, couldn't have wrote that. Must have been somebody else that wrote it, and they signed Peter's name on it. Well, I say hogwash. Huh? Peter's hand wrote the book of 1 Peter, this epistle, this letter. And the reason he was to, able to write so eloquently, the reason he was able to write uh, so perfectly is because the Holy Spirit got in his hand. Amen? I mean, these people who claim such don't know the same uh, God that I know, evidently. I mean, after all, 1 Corinthians 1.26 uh, puts it very well. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, now, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You see that? He didn't choose the eloquent orators, although there have been some sprinkled in there. He didn't choose the, the well-learned. He chose those that knew where the power came from. He chose, those, he chose those who, when they did do marvelous works, they couldn't help but attribute it to God because they knew it wasn't in them. See, a prideful man is hard to use, or a prideful woman. God wants to find humble people, people who know they can't do it without Him. People that know uh, as, they are as the, the branch broken off of the vine, that there'd be no fruit born if they were to abide by themselves. God calls people who know they need to abide in Him to bring forth fruit and to prosper. Amen. I was talking to a preacher the other day. Uh, he, he couldn't read, but I told him he's got a good heart and I can tell he loves the Lord. And he was talking about he don't know why the Lord would call him to preach. I said, I know exactly why the Lord called you to preach. Because the Lord likes to use the base thing. God likes to use the nobodies. God likes to use the unlearned. Amen. I said, I don't know why he chose me either, brother. Because I'm, I'm backwards. I couldn't, I couldn't talk to a group of people. I've always been that way. I've always been an introvert. I don't know why God would pick me, naturally speaking. I wasn't a good choice. But God chose me because when I, when I did accomplished that I'd know it was him that did it not myself amen and he get the glory for it now this man who wrote this book or pinned it down rather he was given the name Simon at birth and it means he has heard or God has heard he's given the name Peter by the Lord which is the Greek word Petros which means a piece of a rock or a small stone this name change uh, probably signified a change in nature as it does with many folks whose names are changed by the Lord. This wasn't some selfish thing somebody was doing or some vain thing. People nowadays are changing their names all over the place. But this change signified something. Something very important and something that came from God. See, God changes things. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. And when I think of that verse, and I think about name changes, I think about Jacob. Jacob's name means supplanter, or conniver. When the Lord changed his name, he changed his name to Israel, which means prince. Signifying the change that God made. Took him from being a scoundrel into being a, a, a prince with God. Amen? Abraham. God changed his name. His name meant high father. Well, that's actually his name originally was Abram. Without the ham on the end. Which means high father. But when he started walking with God, God called him Abraham. Which means the father of multitude. It has to do with the promise that God made to him. That uh, through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And that seed is talking about Christ. But he also promised that his seeds would be as the sands of the seashore and the stars of the heavens. Even though he was 100 years old and still hadn't had a son through his wife. But anyways, I like that. Mays Jackson said his name was Abram. 
And then when he started walking with God, God gave him the ham. Amen. Y'all like ham? But anyway, maybe not since he was, a, well, he wasn't a Jew yet. The law hadn't been given. But anyways, uh, think about this. His name originally, Peter's name, it was Simon. His birth name was Simon. Jesus changed it to Peter. Simon means God has heard. Perhaps it was the prayers of his mom and dad that brought Simon into the world. I don't know, the Bible doesn't talk about his mother being barren, but a lot of times in the Bible uh, there were barren women who prayed and God gave them a child. Maybe that was it. Maybe they had a hard time conceiving and, and they prayed and then God gave them a boy and, and she, they named him. Uh, God has heard. But I like the name that Jesus gives to him too. It means a piece of a rock. He was just another man, a piece of clay, but God made a rock out of him. And he can make a rock out of you too. Amen? I think about, I think about a rock. What do you think of? I think of that one that uh, David got out of the brook. We got five of them actually. But it only took one to be hurled at that giant to bring that giant down, right? Huh? And then David cut his head off. And I think about that victory. I think of Christ being the rock. Peter's a, a small stone. Maybe it's like the old saying, the chip off the old block. He's a, he's a piece of what is the whole of Christ. But anyways, I, I find that very interesting. And by the way, a verse that is always uh, messed up by a lot of people is that verse where Jesus said, uh, uh, Thou art Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church. There's a big misunderstanding about it. The Catholics had that all upside down. What Jesus is saying is this. Thou art Peter, a small stone, Petros, small stone, you're a small stone, Peter. And then he says, upon this rock, Petros, which means a gigantic boulder. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And I believe if you could see Jesus' hand gestures, it would be this. Thou art Peter, a small stone. Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Christ is the rock the church is built upon. And you find that throughout the scriptures. The Bible says uh, that he's the foundation of the church. But anyways, he's the chief cornerstone. Isn't that the, the large stone? Huh? The Petros. Hope I'm getting those Greek words right. It's been a long time since I heard them. But anyways. He was commanded to strengthen the brethren. This Peter was. Luke chapter 22 verse 32 says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And this is Christ talking. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And I believe Peter fulfills what Jesus said partially right here at this letter. This letter, strengthen the brethren. It was written to back then. And it still can bring strength to you today if you'll take heed to it. If you'll read it and let it soak into your soul. By the way, I believe you also should strengthen the brethren. Just as, as Peter did. You say, how do I strengthen the brethren? Well, encourage them. Huh? But what we got too much of in churches today all throughout the world is that people just want to tear other people down. Well, we're not to tear each other, we're to build each other up. Now there are some things that may need to be tore down. But certainly when somebody is wounded, you don't just shoot them. You try to pick them up. You try to restore such a one if you can. Strengthen the brethren. I'm hoping you're getting stronger today by hearing the word of God. Peter did live up to his name for the most part. And uh, in John chapter 6, verse 66, it says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus was preaching and he said, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you got no part of me. And some of the people didn't understand that. It was a hard saying. And they went away. I can see Christ speaking to a multitude and a bunch just turn around and walk off and leave him. And he looks over to the disciples and said, will you all leave too? Peter says, where would we go? Like that song, where could I go but to the Lord? 
Where would I go? You got the words of eternal life. Peter did the right thing there. He was a rock. When all these people walked away, they were sand. But Peter stood as a rock. And in Mark chapter 8, verse 27, it says, He saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith, Thou art the Christ. And there was a debate on who Jesus was. Peter said, He's the one, you're the one. He was a rock. He knew about trials too. Peter was not one who, who never knew what it was like to suffer. He certainly did suffer. And I think about Peter too and his death. When they were going to crucify him, he said, I don't want to die in the same manner my Lord died. He said, crucify me upside down. What a rock he was then. But he knew something about trials because he was actually attacked personally by the devil. Now, I highly doubt that anybody in this congregation here has ever been personally attacked by the devil himself. Now, I'm going to say this. The devil is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at one time. That's God. God is the only being who is everywhere all at one time. He's the only omnipresent person. And I know you might say, well, Santa Claus, no, 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 no. Jesus is the only one who's everywhere. Amen. The devil is in one place. We're studying the book of Revelation, and it's talking about his seat being in Pergamos or his throne. But we do did also look at this in the book of Revelation uh, that he has many demons that follow him. And a third of the angels followed him and they're out there in the world and they're doing his work. And by proxy, the devil does attack you through his demons. But by the way, he doesn't have to attack most people because most people are already defeated by their own flesh. Your worst enemy is that person in the mirror. But Satan actually attacked Peter. Listen to Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. It's Jesus talking to, to Peter. And he calls him Simon right here. He says, But the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He's going he's gonna to see what you're made out of. He's going to try you. And I tell you what, Peter failed right there too, by the way. Showing he's just a man. That's biblical Christianity, friends. When you start getting prideful, and when you have some wins, that's when you're most vulnerable to fall. Peter had some wins, didn't he? He walked on water to the Lord, didn't he? Until he started to sink, but then he got picked back up out of the, out of the angry billows. But also, he answered who Christ was rightly. Huh? Peter did a lot of good stuff. Maybe that made him proud. So the devil was allowed to humble him. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Peter surely fell. He didn't fall from grace or God's salvation, no. He, he fell from his uh, place of position where he was taking a stand and being that stone for God. But he also knew forgiveness, which is a, an excellent thing. I, I love this. And I, I know I point it out a lot. And y'all probably heard me point it out quite often. But after Peter fa fell, after he was sifted as wheat and came up short, he went out and he wept bitterly. And then the women came. They were going to come to the tomb to visit. And they seen the stone rolled away. And an angel standing there. And an angel said, but he's not here, he's risen. He said, go tell his disciples. And I love what he says. He says, and Peter also. He singled Peter out. See, Peter needed a little bit of extra comfort, didn't he? And God knew it. God knew Peter needed it. Tell Peter too. So he goes and tells the disciples, and they go and they tell Peter, even though they, they doubt it. Uh, you know, John and Peter took off racing. To the tomb, and, and John uh, was younger, so he, got, he was faster. Got there first. But, anyways, uh, uh, when Jesus meets back with the disciples, I love what he does. Now, Peter denied the Lord how many times? Three times. 
Then Jesus asked him three times, Lovest thou me? And gave him an opportunity to say, Yea, Lord, I love thee three times. There may be more reasons for that. That may not be the reason, but I tell you what, it certainly seems like a wonderful thing to me that they match. He was greatly used of God too, which gives us an example of this. That no matter how much of a mess you make of things, you can come back and be used of God again. I mean, Peter, after he denied the Lord, was able to preach at Pentecost. And 3,000 souls got saved. He was able to preach and 5,000 souls got saved after that. He was able to go to Cornelius and the Italian band and unlock the keys of the kingdom of the Gentiles who come into the church of the living God. He was there at the gate beautiful and gave, uh, gave the man uh, a miracle there through the power of God. And he said, silver and gold have I none such as I have. Give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. But you know what? Even after he got right and did these and had this revival and saw these wonderful things done, he's still not perfect. Neither are you. Neither am I. I hope you love me, but I don't have, uh, don't have too much confidence in me. I hope you got some confidence in me because I live for the Lord. I try to. You know, but don't put all, all your eggs in that basket. I'm not perfect. Neither was Peter. Galatians 2.11 this is Paul talking. He said, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood into the face because he was to be blamed. Peter messed up, even after the fact. What happened is he, he was sitting with some Gentiles because the Gentiles were put on even ground. They were brought nigh by the blood of Christ. He was eating with them. When some Jews come in, he got up and removed himself. And that, that left a bad example. So Paul got in his face and said, you're wrong, Peter. But you know what I like that? He addresses Brother Paul later on in these epistles. He didn't get mad. He realized faithful the wounds of a friend. He was a work in progress. By the way, he certainly was not some infallible pope, as some would put him. He was an apostle, which means a sent one. Uh, when you see apostles in the Bible, that means someone who is commissioned personally by Christ and sent. Now, there's no more apostles being called. You'll find a lot of people say they're an apostle, but they're not. Amen. Watch anybody that calls himself apostle. They're a false teacher. There's many, a, Especially over, over in Africa, there's a lot of folks there that call themselves an apostle. And some even here. But if you look at the word in its basic most meaning, we all are apostles. We're all sent by God in that, in that manner. Not personally by him appearing unto us, but he has sent us through the great commission to be sent. To go out in the highways and hedges, compel folks to come, to be a witness, to be an ambassador. We talked about the one the Lord used to pin this. Then let's talk about the recipients here just for a little bit. And we may wrap it up with this and, and continue next week. But who, who did he write this to? Well, in verse 1 he says he's writing to the strangers. That means sojourners. That, that's all of us, really. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the souls. We are not of this world. We're citizens of heaven. We're only passing through. We're not going to be here very long. We're going to move out. That's why Paul, through the inspiration of God, described our bodies as a tent that wears out and is folded up and we have a house in the heavens not made with hands. Uh, we read about Jesus talking about our home which is in the heavens uh, which he made for us in John 14. Many mansions. We are citizens of heaven by faith. So it's to us. Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That word conversation means citizenship. Our citizenship's in heaven. 
We like Abraham look for a city which is to come. Hebrews 11.9 says, uh, By faith he sojourned in a land of promise in a strange country. That's where we're at today. We're in a strange country. Dwelling in tabernacles. That's tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And that's what we're looking for. Not the works of man's hands that will fall. We're looking for that city that God hath built. That city made of gold. We're going to enter into it one day. And we're going to be citizens there. We already are citizens there. We're going to move in. We are considered strangers by the world too. We're strange. We should be strange in the eyes of the Lord. They should be kind of like looking at us saying, well, What's going on with those people? They're different. Huh? We ought to be different. First Peter 4.4 4 says, Where they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. You don't run towards the same excess, the same emptiness they run to. We're not running after the worldly crowd and after worldly things and, and after our own lusts. We're seeking that which is better and higher. These believers were scattered now, this word uh, strangers and, and scattered is often used of the diaspora, which means the, the group of Jews that were scattered by Nebuchadnezzar. The tribes of Israel, the, twelve, the ten lost tribes and the two of Benjamin and, uh, and uh, Judah. I can't think of the other one there. But anyways, that, the spread. And a lot of people say this is a Hebrew Christian epistle. And I, I get why they say that. It probably was, it may have been handed to Hebrew Christians, but this epistle also references Gentiles too. We, we Gentiles are scattered people too, are we not? We're scattered all over the place. I got friends who are Christians all over the world. Got Jonathan and Natalie over in England. Got some over in Africa. We got Christians scattered through all the the family of God um, is is one body, but that body is scattered all over the world right now. One day it will come together. We are a scattered people. One thing we know about the scattered people is that they were going through a time of suffering. These scattered people, whether it's Jew or Gentile, he's speaking to here. He says in verse two, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. They were elect. They were separated for a purpose. As Israel of old was called from Ur and given the law and, and spoken to by the prophets and shown favor, we too are separated uh, uh, by the Spirit unto obedience that we are to be conforming to His uh, will and to His word. It says by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, we're only a part of this elect group because we've been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. When we look to Him in faith, believing that He is the only way, truth, and the life, we were sprinkled with the blood of atonement. Are you sprinkled with the blood of atonement? Have you been saved? Are you born again? Are you a part of His elect? And by elect, I don't mean uh, that, that you're the only ones that could possibly have been saved or you're elected to be saved before, uh, before you were even born. No, I'm talking about the elect as being those who have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been elect, made elect by faith. I like this combination here that it's used very often in the scriptures. He says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Grace means unmerited favor. I hope I've said that enough. You know that. You didn't deserve it, but you got it. But you notice always that peace follows after. It's always grace and peace. Because without grace, there's no peace. If you've not experienced the unmerited favor of God, you are at enmity with God. You're His enemy. But if you had experienced grace, you would have the peace. He talks about verse 3. He talks about mercy. It says, Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Abundant mercy. Now, grace is giving somebody what they don't deserve. 
Mercy means not giving us what we deserve. They're kind of the opposites, ain't they? See, grace, unmerited favor. I didn't deserve His love. I didn't deserve His great sacrifice. That's grace. But mercy is this. I deserve to die and go to hell. I deserve death. But He didn't give me that. That's mercy. And so it's a coin with mercy on one side and grace on the other. Grace showing uh, the, the loving kindness of God and mercy showing how He bestowed it upon us. He's begotten us again according to this verse. Verse 3. That's just another way to say we is born again. Begotten means born. Remember back in there, I, I, we used to do a thing called the Bible Marathon. We'd read the Bible from the beginning to the end. And I always tried not to get them begotten, begotten chapters. Because they'd just be a whole pages and chapters of so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so. And it really wasn't all the begatten that was going on. It was the names of the people being begat was hard to pronounce. I didn't want to read them out loud. But uh, it just means to be born. To be born again. That's how we're saved. It's being born again. We were born into sin. We were born into Adam uh, the first time. When we're born again, we're born spiritually. We're born into the kingdom of God. Unto a lively hope. Not to die, but to live. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. But when we were born again, we got a lively hope. We were alive. We were quickened by the power of God. And by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, since He raised, we also will raise one day. It all comes down to this. Have you been born again? Have you trusted Christ? I want you to examine yourselves tonight as we pray.